everyone, and welcome to the Amber Data Derivatives Podcast. I'm here with Guillaume Lambert, who is the CEO and co-founder of Panoptic. Panoptic is a new DeFi options protocol that we'll explore today. Guillaume, how are you? Hey, I'm very good, Greg. How are you? Doing well, doing well. So, Guillaume, I was thinking maybe we could just start with a little bit about your background. Uh, we were chatting before this. You actually went to U Chicago, so maybe we could just chat about you know what's your background and how did you find your way into crypto? Yeah, yeah, sure. So. Currently, I'm an assistant professor in applied physics at Cornell University. So this is very remote, I guess, from um, uh, crypto, but I've gone in through the traditional kind of academic route. So I did my undergrad, again, in, in, in Montreal, McGill University, but I went to the U.S. to study for my PhD in physics. I went to U Chicago as my postdoc, spent some time in Boston, landed a tenure track position, the dream job, I guess, if you're in academia at uh, Cornell University. And again, this is this was going very well. And overall, I was always at the forefront of uh, technology and the latest advances in my research. That meant I was also attuned to the developments in crypto, Ethereum, and everything else. So on the side, I was a big user of uh, the early DeFi protocols. So MakerDAO, Uniswap, I, I can't, my, my CDP got li liquidated in MakerDAO. Uh, so at the end of the day, I was very eager to use, I mean, Ethereum and DeFi protocols. And um, that kind of what was my hobby, more or less. So when Uniswap v3 uh, launched, I was excited to try this new way of providing liquidity. So it's a concentrated liquidity. You can choose the range. You can be directional a little bit. I found it very interesting. So the first few times I tried LPing, actually, I got wrecked. I the price moved in a way I didn't expect. I went out of bound. I ended up with a bunch of uh, maybe uh, tokens I didn't want. So I decided to take a few steps back and just study Uniswap v3 as you would study any kind of scientific topic. So this is this was a summer project, more or less, that started in, in 2021. Just sat down, pen and paper in hand, trying to de derive the equations, the math, the PNL of an LP position. And through that process, I kind of quickly realized that the payoff or the the actual yeah, PNL of a LP token in Uniswap looks a lot like a short put, as if we were selling a put option or a covered call if it's kind of in the money. So that was kind of, I knew about options as well. So I said, okay, wait, this is, looks like an option. So I was kind of um, researching this on my own, publishing my, my results on my Medium blog as I was kind of discovering new things. My first blog post was uh, in June 2021 saying, LP tokens as perpetual options. So this was kind of very way back then, the first few key realizations. It took a while to figure this out more fully. But again, starting from this idea that providing liquidity in a concentrated AMM like Uniswap V3, providers on the option payoff, then you can manage your position a bit better. That means you can hedge the deltas. You can actually control your gammas. You can do all the, uh, you can like balance your creeks the same way you balance it for your options portfolio. So that helped me. I was continuing to write these articles on, on Medium, but it helped me be kind of kind of successful in terms of LPing. Again, I've managed hundreds of positions at the retail level, of course, with my, what do you want, maybe beer money, something I wasn't uh, quite sad to see gone. But overall, I was kind of, playing with Uniswap, finding a way to kind of make it more options-like in my management. And eventually that kind of allowed me to be successful. But I was uh, able to get in touch with uh, another Cornell PhD, uh, Jesper Christensen, my co-founder. And he was part of an incubating company. And he said, why don't we try to kind of expand this beyond just LP, LPing, but rather, can we make this into a fully fledged options protocol? Hmm. So that was the beginning of, of Panoptic. I went on sabbatical for my position at Cornell just to focus on this uh, starting in the spring 2022. And overall, uh, we write, wrote a white paper. We were able to kind of actually write smart contracts. Uh, the, the bear market hit last year. So uh, we got spun out of that incubator, but we powered through. And, and again, me and Jesper finished coding the contract. And at the end, we were able to, again, Find a company, get to a point where the, the 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 protocol seems to be working again on our our on our computers, and we can actually trade options using LP uh, Uniswap V3 as kind of the clearinghouse. But yes, more or less, we we are at the point where we're ready to launch. So in the Ju in, in in July, in a, in a few few uh, few weeks, we'll be launching in a uh, on a layer two. We'll do a trading competition of sorts, try to test the game theory. But we started what started again uh, two years ago into an idea of me with pen and paper. Now is almost ready to be launched and we will be kind of uh, unlocking, if you want, the power of options based on what Uniswap kind of was able to do since two years, but now we're kind of finally able to unlock this. Cool, that's that's really fascinating. So maybe for people who are not familiar with Uniswap V2 or, or V1 or V3, so like 
maybe we could just touch on that. So the original Uniswap sort of trading algorithm is a constant product function. So there's always kind of a 50-50 ratio of, of assets. How does V3 differ from that? And where does the option like payoff uh, lie embedded in V3? Yeah, exactly. So again, the the big again, innovation of AMM was that you could trade without having a market maker or any intermediary. It was a, a peer to protocol type of interaction. But yes, you have two token in the in the smart contract, token A, token B. Uh, if you want to buy token A, you have to remove it from the pool, add more of token B. Mm -hmm. So by trading, you shift the balance of the mm -hmm. two assets. So if everybody wants to buy token A, there's less token A, more token B. But the ratio of these two tokens gives you the price. So the more you buy, the more difficult, I guess, the more expensive the the, the, the asset becomes. So it's a very natural way of, again, creating or responding to the market demand, more buying, more expensive, more selling, less expensive. So that's kind of a the, the innovation. No one has to be market making. No one has to kind of be signing uh, market orders or whatnot. It's very, very straightforward. So that's Uniswap V1 and V2, very straightforward. You could provide liquidity yourself where you would be providing these tokens. You would uh, collect fees on any trade. And as a passive investor, it was very easy to dump some of your ETH, some of your stable coin, come back in a few months and get more vote, more both, and then you were happy of, of doing this. And so that's kind of how it worked up until 2021. Yeah, and I guess one of the key features is that the liquidity is kind of evenly distributed throughout the whole sort of price spectrum. And that That's right. You can go and trade all the way to zero or infinity. Mm -hmm. The liquidity that is deposited is always kind of used to some extent. The key point is that it's used everywhere. So you can be trading against the liquidity at the current price, but some of that liquidity is unused and deployed far away to mm -hmm. cover these 10 to the negative 10 prices and 10 to the 10, these very, very, very far unlikely prices still have to have a bunch of liquidity there. So that's why as a first step, it revolutionized the way that people traded on, on the blockchain, I guess, or in DeFi, but it, it, it had a lot of inefficiencies. So that's where Uniswap V3 came in, mm -hmm. where instead of saying I'm providing liquidity for all prices possible, zero to infinity, the protocol allowed users to concentrate or provide a range as to where the liquidity will be deployed. So you can say now I'm going to deploy liquidity between 1500 and 2500 uh, ETH price. So as long as you're within that range, you collect fees or you kind of mm. collect a steady return. If you're outside of that range, you collect nothing. So your liquidity become unused, becomes unused. So that new um, choosing a range, being able to kind of be above, below, so, so, or very centered allowed kind of more, more use cases. But it made it a bit more difficult for, for those that used to be passively generating income now had to be, if they were passive, they would, again, get wrecked or at least not get the returns they would expect because the price did move more often than outside of that range. And now for the, the range, could it be any width? So let's say I want to do like a 50 cent wide range. Can I do that? Yeah, so there's a, a fundamental limit if you want. So it's a tick. Each It's a tick spacing. Each tick is uh, one basis point. So, so one ten thousand of a price. So you could do fifty cents if you want. Uh, some pools have a minimum tick size, so that you can you you don't have like fragmentation and like mm. a lot of chooses choices whenever you deploy. So most pools have either a one percent wide tick, uh, thirty basis point tick, or five basis point. But at the end of the day, it's still fairly granular. So if you have a, uh, you can be very narrow. You can be again pulling all your liquidity, your liquidity in a very narrow range multiplies your return like by tens of thousands fold compared to the full range liquidity. So a yeah. lot of people were excited about, okay, I'm going to get 10,000 times the returns, but then you get, uh, again, uh, your losses also kind of accrue uh, 10 times, 10,000 faster sometimes. So that's kind of the, the drawback. And then does the user have to put in like a, a split ratio of the two assets or can they put in one asset at that range that will flip into the other asset? completely that's correct so this is the beauty you, you can choose whichever range you want your the current price could be in the middle of that range or it could be outside mm -hmm. and if it's outside this is where you provide a single asset and again if the price goes into that range it transforms it if it moves past then you have the other asset in your in your wallet so yes the the it's a lot of freedom a lot of choices something that most um define native users were not used to necessarily that's why also i got the first few times I tried it out because 
I didn't understand the, 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 the system as well as I thought. So then for an example, let's say right now, as we speak, ETH is call it 1800. Let's say I want to do a range. I own ETH in my wallet. I want to stick a range USDC ETH at $2,500 in ETH or whatever, tick uh, a basis point wide at $2,500. So the idea is I have ETH only. I put it into the V3 Uniswap pool. If ETH goes to 2,600, I basically converted my ETH to USDC at 2,500. Sold my ETH essentially yes. is what I did. That starts to look yes. like selling a covered call to me. Exactly. And again, the the the, the fact that price determines the composition of that of that LP token, yes, creates these type of payoffs. But yes, at the end of the day, if you sell a covered call, you own the stocks. You sell a call. 30 delta, 25 delta, 5 delta, whatever you want. But you set a call above the price. If the price increases and goes above this, you are effectively selling your 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 stocks for the price of the strike of your call. In the case of options in TradFi, you get paid right away. So you could use kind of this fund. Mm -hmm. So it's part of your uh, return right away. In the, in the case of Uniswap, the funds only accrue when it's in range. So the price can be at 1800 if it goes to 1500 if it goes back and never touches that area about 2500 you don't collect any premium. So if that... it does go to 2500 hugs it for a while, price turns and goes back down, you can still be in this kind of uh, initial state, but you have premium that, that has been accumulated. And this premium or this return is based on where the price was and how much, how long it stayed in, in that range that, that you, you had your call at. Yeah, that's really interesting. So that's that's a similar concept that we know in, in gamma scalping known as path dependency. So if we're sort yes. of in a high gamma range, our gamma scalping, if we're long the straddle, creates a lot of income or costs us a lot of money if we're short the straddle. But then if we're really far out of the range and there's a lot of volatility, there's not enough delta changes to rebalance. And so there's almost no income or 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 payments made so that's a very similar concept to options. So how does Panoptic essentially convert or create the option option like instrument from the Uniswap V3? What are the mechanics and the details of that? Yeah. So again, in the process of uh, studying it, doing the research, we realized that yes, it's options like, but it's not quite an option where you have the the, the right, but not the obligation of buying the, the, the asset or selling the asset. So it's a slightly different uh, setup. But at the end of the day, the, the key point is that you're um, able to generate the, the payoff, the PL diagram that looks like a short put. And uh, if you have a expiry in TradFi, you know it's going to end at some point. So you can solve Black Scholes or mathematical models and says within the next two weeks, we know what could happen. So you can have some premium that is paid to you if you sell or you pay a premium when you buy. It's like known because there's an expiry. Mm -hmm. In our case, we cannot really implement an expiry because these uh, these positions in Uniswap can live forever. As long as it's in, in the pool, no one will force you to, to remove it. So that means that the options that we're creating have no expiry. They, have, they are perpetual. That means that if you sell an option, you can sell it for one block, which is about 12 seconds, or one year. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. So that means that there's no like um, expiry or or kind of uh, aftermarket settlement that needs to happen. It's it's kind of a perpetual nature. If you want to be uh, very very uh, specific with the details, it's actually expiring every block, every twelve seconds. The option expires. It's redeployed, mm -hmm. expiring, redeployed, expiring, redeployed. So when you close the position, you stop selling it or you stop rolling it. Mm. You you just remove the funds. But otherwise, it's automatically rolled forward. So that's just a different way of thinking about the perpetual nature. It's perpetual sometimes think, people think about way, way out in the future. But here, the perpetual option in Uniswap is very, very short time. You get 12 mm. seconds, which is something you cannot really do in TradFi. Interesting. And so how do the mechanics of uh, Panoptic work? So do you do users supply their funds to Uniswap directly and give you the LP tokens, or do they supply funds to you and then you send it to Uniswap? How does that work? Yeah. So uh, for those that know Uniswap and they that have used the protocol, they know that if you provide liquidity, you get a receipt that says, "Okay, you're the owner of that position." We give you a receipt. This receipt is a uh, NFT, a non fungible token that says you're the owner. 
specific range, specific balance, very, very unique, it's yours. What we've done is that we forked that contract, if you want, and wrote our own version of the, uh, the, the it's called the non NFT position manager, so non-fungible fungible position manager, we rewrote it. But at the end of the day, users interact with the Panoptic protocol or the Uniswap protocol, but it all ends up in the same place, which is the Uniswap pool where mm. the swaps happen. So in our case, users go to the Uniswap interface, deploy liquidity in a Uniswap pool that they want, which is selling, again, an option, but effectively the liquidity goes into Uniswap. They get issued a, uh, an NFT like token receipt. And if that's what they do, it's very similar to what they do in the current status, which is provide liquidity, get a return, and then when you're, you're done with that position, you just close it. The key point is that what the Panoptic protocol enables is that if you are providing liquidity, you're selling an option. Now a buyer can come in and look at what has been sold kind of in, the, in this kind of open market, and they can buy part or all of a, a position that's been sold. And by buying, meaning that you now take the opposite side of that position, which is a long put option, or it, again, there's a, a way to create also long call options. But at the end of the day, it's just we're creating this market, whereas now before you can only provide liquidity and get a receipt and not do anything with it. Now we allow users to, uh, it's not peer-to-peer, -peer, still peer to protocol, but allow users to take the other side and buy or short an LP token to create this kind of long call payoff or long put payoff. I see. And so if I was the Uniswap LP, and let's say I'm selling the ETH call or whether USDC put, they're the same thing, just reverse. So I'm selling the ETH call at 2,500. When that actually executed, when ETH went up to 2,600, I got uh, an LP fee from the trading transactions. Now in the Panoptic version, the idea here is that if I was the option buyer and I saw that $2,500 call and I want to buy it, I just prepay the fees that the, the LP would have gotten in order to have that. So not quite. So the, the, the option that the buyer kind of acquires, they buy it, but it has no cost. The cost starts at zero. And remember it's perpetual. So you never know how long they're going to hold it. Could be one block again, or it could be one year. So the cost of that option that you purchase starts at zero and increases over time. And you can, it, it can go over, uh, I mean, it can stay zero if the price never reaches this 2,500 region. It stays zero, you bought, purchase a call, it costs you nothing, you can actually burn it or unmint it or close that position with no cost. But the premium paid by the buyer will also be pr price dependent. And the more the price kind of hugs that strike, the more you have to pay. And sometimes if you get to a point where you're we're right directionally and the price shoots up to, again, 3,000, 4,000, then it's out of range. It doesn't cost you more. So you can still hold it and not have any any additional kind of premium to pay. I see. So in that example, again, the $2,500 call, the LP collects fees every time we flip from 2,500 to 26 back to 24. That's another full fee back to 26. That's yes. another. So in the call buyer version, that call buyer would be paying out those fees for essentially having that conversion right. But if we just trade that through one time, we pay one set of fees and then they essentially have all the upside. That's right. So it could, it's, it could be a very attractive like way of trading options where you could be paying a fraction of what Black Scholes model would have told you. Or if you're unlucky, you can pay multiples of it. So it, it's, it's going to be a path dependent pricing. Again, we, we're not in control. This is just what, whatever the price does on that particular like set of days. But yes, the, 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 the retail user that may be more accustomed to buying options now will have this maybe once every few <laughs> trades, very cheap option that went in the money in the way that they expected it. Don't have to pay much, but get a, a huge upside. Yeah, interesting. Now, is there like a different fee structure in Uniswap V3 between different pools? Like, is everything charged the same base fee? or do different pools and all coin tokens have higher fees, lo lower fees, stuff like that? Yeah, so th there is some difference. And again, uh, if you do the research, it doesn't matter that much. So the key point is that there are different pools, there are different ways to deploy liquidity. As an LP, that's like one more thing you have to worry about, like which one do I go to? As I mentioned, the, the tick sizes that are predefined are also kind of different pools. So, But if you look at it from a distance, 
the trading activity gets split between these pools in a way that the returns are basically the same regardless. So our, our view is that we'll probably kind of focus on a few um, feet tiers or a few kind of text spacings, but the, the, the users will not necessarily have to kind of uh, choose, do I do pool A or pool B? It's going to be very, very straightforward. Interesting. And like, let's say now that an LP decides to sell that $2,500 call um, and then there's an option buyer who wants to buy, who, who actually buys that $2,500 right who gets to decide that they want to cancel or like pull out of this deal? Is it the option buyer or can the LP decide like, I don't want to renew this anymore? Yeah. So the option buyer has again a bit more power in that sense. Mm -hmm. So they are physically, all physically settled. It's, it's not even a derivative product, mm -hmm. like options derive on the price of, again, the exchange that trades this actual stock. Uh, but in here, it's actually a real physical kind of, again, the token you receive tracks a real chunk of liquidity. So you cannot say as a seller, if you sell an option, someone buys it, they have, a, they don't hold you hostage, but they can keep it for as long as they want. And then you won't be able to close your position because of that. So that's actually a problem. And you can imagine someone kind of buying all the options, locking the L liquidity providers away yeah. from like closing the positions deep in the money, you're bleeding and you can even stop it. So that's kind of one new aspect of perpetual options that we had to kind of solve. So that means that the same way in, in TradFi, you can have early assignment. Mm -hmm. So you set an option, someone assigns early, you're kind of stuck with the shares. You can have a forced exercise event that happens. So the seller wants to close that position. Some buyer has uh, kind of locked some of it away for their, their kind of op optionality. So you can force the exercise of that option. So the buyer, it could be in the money, it could be printing uh, money, but you can force the exercise so that you can free that capital and close your position. So that's a, that there's a small fee associated with it. It's like a different, like maybe game theory that happens whenever you want to force exercise or wait, but that's kind of one of the mechanisms that had to be implemented because there's no expiry in a normal system. You can wait for it to expire. If you wait a few more, it's your DT, you don't wait long, but if it's a monthly option, sometimes like the, 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 the other assignment can be way, way earlier. Here, there's a forced exercise on the buyer side that's kind of a new way that the buyers now will have to worry about to some extent. And what does that force exercise look like? Because in traditional options, if if someone exercises their long options, they essentially take the underlying physical and pay out the premium. So does that mean that the force exercise that the option buyer has now to buy ETH at 2,500? Yes, and, and the key point is that it's only if the ETH is at 4,000 or 5,000 or way, way, way deep in the money that you need to force exercise someone. If it's below, it's actually like a net loss. That it doesn't make sense, but yes. If the price is at 5,000 and the guy, the person still holds their 2,500 call, you can exercise it for them, buy the ETH, um, I mean, uh, buy the ETH, get the, 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 the cash back, and at the end, you can force exercise. So the, 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 you kind of mark to market more or less that position to, in, order, in order to be able to close it. But then and if, it's only again, yeah. But then if it's out of the money, and, the buyer yes. will not doesn't have any exercise risk and can just hold that forever and the LP is kind of stuck? Yes, yeah, so the, the the LP, the position is still out of the meat themselves too, so they don't have a like exposure or they're not in the kind of the gamma risk uh, realm. But yes, that you could also force exercise a deep out of the meat option. And that's also, I mean, the cost structure is, is, is a bit different, but there's also a cost you can force someone to exercise <laughs> for less options just to free up capital. And that's also something that you can do as a, as a buyer, but again, as a seller. But at the end, the, oh, the key point is that you sold an option. If it's there uh, and someone wants to buy it, the 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 if it's out of the money, it's like you have the, the funds or not. It, it doesn't change your PL necessarily, but yes, it's mostly for the in the money, uh, deep in the money options that we have to enforce this way to kind of close a position forcibly for a buyer. Yeah, the deep in the money makes a lot of sense to me because it's very that's very much like an options position that's deep in the money. It just trades like the underlying. So that that that's fine. But I'm still a little confused. So let's say the option buyer buys the option and then the LP how like if the LP changes their mind, because like here's how I think about it. In traditional options, like the longer the option buyer is holding, the more premium they sort of pay. The square root of time pretty much what is what yep. they pay. And same thing with like uh, perpetual futures is like a funding cost and stuff like this.
But now if there's no upfront cost, the buyer can buy the option and then they actually have the option to hold it or, or, or allow the LP to cl close it. So there's like embedded optionality there. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand sort of the, how is the LP not getting kind of hosed here? Yeah, so at the end, the, the, if you're an LP, this is all going to, so going to change the PFU a little bit. What you want to do is to, to sell closer to the money a little bit maybe, but the key point that you have to choose a range. Your range can be also fairly wide. And if you want to sell the same as a, say, 20 Delta option, you can still be quite wide so that it tugs and touches the mm. price on the high end. And that means that as long as you're in range, you collect fees. So even though it's out of the money, you, you can still collect your premium. And the key point is that the buyer as well, since they are reimbursing you, they pay you back that premium, but they also pay a tiny extra spread. So the key point is that if you sell an option and someone buys it, they pay you more than oh, the cool. fees that you would, have, you would have collected. So you actually want to keep this open if it's in range. So the behaviors will have to change. We'll probably see the out of the money sellers be wider and the add the money of close to the money sellers be a much, much more tighter. That and if you sense. know about Uniswap, there's a liquidity distribution and it's like almost gosh and safe, but it, it's, it's, it, now it's going to like inform on the kind of skew of the market to some extent, where are the options purchased, where are they sold in a way that is very options driven as opposed to just like the, 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 the random nature of like uh, providing liquidity in Uniswap A3. Yeah, that makes sense. And you were saying that the LP actually earns a higher fee than what they would normally with B3? Yes. And that, that's kind of the, the, the killer, killer feature, I'd say. You could do more, a very similar uh, set of like providing liquidity in Uniswap. But if you do the same thing in Panoptic and someone buys it, again, there's a, a, an extra spread that is created. And the spread is actually uh, pretty aggressive. <laughs> so if you want to buy 50% of an option, someone sold one ETH or maybe like a, a, a thousand uh, short put at the thousand strike, a thousand USD with a software, someone can buy half of it. So they're going to pay about 10% um, more for the premium. So the premium is X, they pay 1.1 X. If they want to buy 90% of it, the premium will be twice as high. Mm. If they want to buy 99% of it or one like 9999, they can pay multiples, hundreds of times more. So there's going to be an a, a, a an optimization from the buyer's side as well so that they don't buy all of it and get more or less liquidated in the first trade that happens in that range. So that's kind of the, the, the spread that does depend on the utilization, the activity. So from a seller's point of view, you want to sell where there's demand for buying because the buyers will increase your revenues. And the buyers may want to go somewhere else because they, they're going to have less of a spread. So it's also going to be a little bit more bi-directional in a way that sellers now will have a direct incentive to sell at the hot zones if you want and not go their own way and sell in a super weird like uh thousand point zero one two five six for instance yeah so. that's interesting so the more there's demand from option buyers the more utilization is higher which costs extra money which is paid to the lp so the lp is like rewarded for having an in-demand sort of yeah so, being an in -demand we, we say, so this is a vega type term that you have in your pricing. So Vega is not now based on like implied volatility, it's actually based on real buyer's demand. So so it's a it's a Vega like term where the more buyers you have, typically this increases the mm -hmm. IV, which is a bit more abstract. Mm -hmm. Here more buyers increases the spread. And that spread now directly goes to the sellers. So again, the the I'm trading options myself in TradFi, I always look for like elevated IV and this is where I sell my options and, and I will probably do a very similar thing in, in the Panoptic, but I'll, it's going to be even easier to not just choose which pools, but also which strikes to sell because we'll see kind of which, which ones are the, the most traded ones. Yeah, that's really interesting. So the utilization fee increase is basically like implied vol being bid up, which is essentially the, the, the Vega cost. Yeah, very yes, interesting. exactly. So, so, and also because it, it's perpetual, and as I mentioned earlier, it's expiring every block, you can always leave that position without having to buy it back at the higher price, which is something that I'm most often stuck with selling option. I'm short premium, vol expansion. I, I have a loss that I have to, to kind of realize because I need to buy it back. Here, it, you stop selling. If you want, you can exit it without having this extra cost. So I think the, the it's, it's again, a new way of trading options. Buyers will be able to buy 
zero cost options, sellers will have to be will have to be able will be able to get a more direct exposure to Vega. Mm-hmm. And hopefully this is gonna maybe transform a little bit how options are are traded, not just in, in DeFi, but also like TradFi. We can imagine commodities, anything that needs to be like traded in the options like market, expiries add a lot of uh, liquidity fermentation and barriers if you have something that is kind of much more direct, much more kind of, again, this perpetual nature makes it really easy to trade. We can expect, ex- expect the same kind of model perhaps to expand to different markets. Yeah, that's fantastic. And then one of the really interesting things is now we start to get altcoin optionality that we can't find anywhere else. Yeah, I'll be happy to buy puts on Shiba Inu. Uh, <laughs> someone has provided liquidity in that pool. They are ready to sell or get to get this short ball exposure. Yes, I'll be happy to buy those puts. So again, the same way that with Uniswap, uh, it made it easy to list any tokens. And for those that are a bit more definitive, there's the Pepe token that was kind of uh, increasing the gas fees and high demand. You could sell options on the Pepe token. And people were selling options because they were providing liquidity, but no one could buy them. Mm. They were stuck in this kind of full range and, and more difficult to manage way of providing liquidity. So yes, the, the long tail of assets, even if you're the only seller, it's enough for a market to exist. You don't have to have a huge inventory. You have to just sell, and as long as someone buys, you're happy. So you you, you buy it buy, you can sell to different places. So it, it's a very organic uh, way of linking the spot market and the options market. And again, you know the options in TradFi are traded in Chicago. Stocks are in New York. There used to be an optical fiber that would be routed through the optimal path to shave off a few nanoseconds. By the time the the, the the price feed is updated, your FPGA can compute the vol surface faster. You have a few milliseconds of ahead time, and that was very profitable. Mm. Now, spot trading markets and options are the same pool, the same smart contract, the same place. There's no writing of the price because price is directly impacting both the fees collected and also like the in the money, all the money, moneyness of the option. That's fantastic. So you mentioned that you guys are going to launch in July. Are you on an L2? Yeah, so we, we like most protocols, we are testing our product, our, our smart contract. We're going to an audit now. It's going to be completed in a few weeks. Uh, but most protocols go through a testnet phase where it's not real money and then it's just a way to test out the different use cases. Mm-hmm. In our case, since we're relying on Uniswap, which is this kind of AMM, we cannot go on a testnet uh, pool because there needs to be a real price feed. There needs to be some active organic activity. We don't want to spend like, uh, again, uh, testnet E arbitrary arbing the pool. So we'll go on a layer two and we'll make it so that there's going to be a limited number of users that can use the protocol, limited amount of funds they can control. So maybe like a few hundred dollars per user and we'll do a trading competition so that there's something at stake. But cool. the key point is that we want to test the, the game theory if you want. Sellers, buyers, even market makers will all have different incentives. So we'll do this kind of rolling competition where every week we'll, we'll rank best, best to worst, boot the bottom performing uh, accounts, onboard new users, have something that is, is a bit more dynamic, and then we'll get feedback from users to know, okay, what works, what didn't, and then overall kind of improve the system. So over, over the summer, this is what we'll do. We aim to launch on mainnet with no kind of no 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 limitations or everything permissionless in the fall so October but overall the 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 we we'll go to yeah battle testing the protocol is what we'll do over the next few months yeah that's fantastic and Guillaume if someone wants to learn more about Panoptic like where where do they go yeah so we have a, a Twitter uh, channel we have a Discord uh, the keep the, we. Your audience probably knows about options and the the new again all sorts now DeFi options may be a bit more exotic. In the world of DeFi or blockchain, options are very complicated. Mm-hmm. So we have to bridge the gap between the two. So it, it, we, we create a lot of research content, actually. So on our Twitter, we have a, a sub stack where we do back tests. We do kind of a bit more like quant, quant-like analysis, a bit more mathy analysis. So we try to demonstrate and kind of bridge the gap between the quants on the option side and the DGENs maybe on the <laughs> DeFi side, that they, they, they can now see options as a valuable kind of way to invest. And yeah, so a lot of it, we we have, again, the Panoptic XY, XYZ website it has kind of links to all of these places. But yes, we, we again, we, I'm options build in TradFi. I'm building this options protocol because I want to trade options on these tokens that are very volatile, very juicy premium. And it's kind of 
I, I, I'm not buying stocks or I'm not buying perps even. It's very, very boring, very directional. There's not much you can do with it. Options are much more important. Again, I didn't say it, but we can do multi-legged strategies, defined risk, like you can have like a straddle being more capital efficient than a naked put. So overall, we try to be very options-like in both capital efficiency and also kind of the ability of, of be directional and strategic. But yes, this is kind of missing now in, in what, what the, 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 the DeFi world needs, I guess. That, that, that's communicating this and making sure that people understand that, okay, options are not just buying calls on GameStop, but rather this very, very um, strategic, very, very complex, but in a good way, way to invest. And you get paid for that work. So it's a bit more difficult, but you can pay more than buy and hold. That's what I want to see happen with, with Penelope. Yeah, that's fantastic. And then uh, just kind of last question here. What do you like to do outside of developing the protocol and teaching at Cornell? Yeah, so again, teaching, uh, I love my job. Uh, actually, I'm phasing out, focus full-time on Panoptic. This has taken a lot of my time, and I think this is kind of the, the next stage in my life. So I'm happy, and again, my, few, my, my grad students are graduating this summer, so it kind of works out. But yes, I have a two-year-old at home as well. Lots of time I'm playing with the park outside, taking long walks. I live in Boston too, so, so there's a lot of parks around. And yes, the, 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 the fatherhood made it difficult to have a hobby. <laughs> But yes, for now, it's spending time with our family is kind of what I enjoy the most, uh, besides, again, working on Panopic. Love it. And since we're both French-Canadian, do you ever make it out back to Montreal? Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm actually also from Quebec City. So Montreal, Quebec City, if your listeners want to see uh, a new flavor of North America, <laughs> come and see Quebec. It's very, very unique. And yes, I, I do go there uh, very often. All of my, my family, my wife's family is from there too. So yes, we... we uh, yes, the, we, we are very, very uh, close to our family there in, in Canada. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I got family in Montreal myself. Uh, I've never been to Quebec City, but I'll, I'll be going to Montreal this summer. So maybe yeah, I'll... Go, go, yeah, go in the summer, not the winter. Winter is, is <laughs> yes. uh, deadly. So yeah, you wait think, till it gets warm. For people who've never been there, you think Chicago winters are bad. Montreal winters are much worse. That's right. I did, <laughs> I did spend time in Chicago, even Boston. So so. We drive north to actually enjoy the winter. We like snow. We like the cold. We actually, I don't want to sweat in my winter coat. I want to be comfortable. So it needs to be whatever, negative 40 outside. Well, we Guillaume, be comfortable. thank you so much for coming on. I'm really excited to see your project. I'm really excited for your soft launch this summer and your full full launch in September or October, I mean, in fall. Um, and we'll, we'll keep tabs on it. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much, Greg. And everyone Bye. who's tuned in, we'll see you next time. Have a good one.